Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gubin Alexander, and I'm an advocate in Ukraine, actively participating in the activities of the Family, Civil and Inheritance Law Committee of Ukrainian Bar Association. I'm proud to present this Hack Convention 1980 event together with my co-moderator, brilliant Elizabeth Lucas, chair of the Family Law Committee of the International Bar Association, being in charge of the law office of Elizabeth Lucas. First off, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all of our honorable speakers. We've got today a really astonishing lineup of one of the most outstanding family law practitioners in the field, both from Ukraine and worldwide. I'm also grateful to IBA for their invaluable support and dedication during the preparation of the event. I have a ton of respect for everyone, but without Barbara Connolly's guidance and Carolina Padrena's extensive net of contacts, this meeting in such impressive gathering would not be possible. My sincere thanks also go to Child Abduction Lawyers Association based, based in London, UK. The main question of the event actually contains in its title, the war in Ukraine and 1980 Hug Child Abduction Convention, to return or not to return. I urge the audience to use the seldom opportunity and ask their questions. We, together with Elizabeth, will check this. Uh, we'll, we'll check the meeting uh, chat from time to time and we'll read them, if any. We will introduce every speaker before their respective speeches in order to save time at the beginning. Without any further delays, I'm passing the word to my co-host, Mrs. Lucas. Dobry uh, Ranuk. And good morning from my office here in the Boston area. I'm just minutes from Harvard and MIT. And I, as uh, my colleague Alex said, I am the uh, chair of the Family Law Committee of the International Bar Association. And uh, on behalf of the IBA, I welcome you all and I thank each and every panelist for joining us for this incredibly important topic and this webinar. Um, I'm going to save my other comments for the end of the webinar because I'd like to use this couple of minutes to just re read to you the um, opening of the convention. The opening uh, comments of the convention, because I think it's important for um, those who are attending the webinar to be familiar with the words and the importance of the convention words um, as we discuss this topic. So the Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction concluded on the October 25th, 1980. The state signatory to the present convention firmly convinced that the interests of children are of paramount importance in matters relating to their custody, desiring to protect children internationally from the harmful effects of their wrongful removal or retention and to establish procedures to ensure their prompt return to the state of their habitual residence, as well as to secure protection for rights of, excuse me, access, have resolved to conclude a convention to this effect and have agreed upon the following provisions. I'm not gonna read them all. But Article 1 states the objection of the obj objects of the present convention are a to secure the prompt return of children wrongfully removed to or retained in any contracting state and b to ensure that rights of custody and of access under the law of one contracting state are effectively respected in the other contracting state. I think that's super important for us to remember as we discuss today this topic. So I thank you all for coming and we will uh, now continue with our yes, first yes, speaker. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Alice. Uh, and our first speaker of the today's event is uh, Maria Snishko, Chief Executive Officer of the International Law Department of the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine, which is a central authority for the majority of the international treaties of our state, including abduction convention. She will uh, provide us with really interesting insight regarding the main challenges that MJU uh, faces when dealing with the High Convention 1980, as well as much needed statistics with regard to the number of return requests to Ukraine filed to CA recently. Pani Maria Vamslova. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, I would like to uh, to talk about uh, the main challenges uh, for the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine as a central authority for the 1980 Child Abduction Convention uh, during uh, the martial law in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to point that since the beginning of the war in uh, February uh, 2022, uh, the appropriate declaration uh, was made uh, by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, concerning uh, the uh, impossibility to fulfill uh, completely our international obligations uh, on the territory of Ukraine uh, until uh, the sovereignty and our uh, territory uh, integrity uh, will be uh, uh, um, restored fully, uh, completely uh, state of all over the territory of Ukraine. Uh, the appropriate uh, declaration uh, is available on the web page of the Hague conference. Uh, uh, the full text uh, you can find. Uh, so, um, uh, despite uh, the war, uh, the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine continues to operate uh, the abduction convention uh, fully. Uh, so, we, uh, as before, as it was uh, before the war and uh, after the war started, uh, we operate all four kinds of uh, the applications. So the return applications, uh, both uh, uh, concerning the return of the child from Ukraine abroad and uh, concerning the return uh, of the child uh, to Ukraine uh, from abroad and uh, two kinds of access applications concerning the child who uh, resides in Ukraine and who resides abroad. Of course, uh, as we all aware, a lot of people, uh, a lot of namely women with their children uh, moved abroad. So uh, this situation, uh, unfortunately, uh, impact on the uh, all these kind of apl applications we deal with and on the general situation with the uh, application of the convention in Ukraine. Uh, so, um, uh, the statistic of the case is as follows. Uh, since uh, February uh, 2022, uh, as a central authority, we received uh, 86 applications on the return of this child to Ukraine. Uh, from January uh, of this year till uh, the 1st of July, uh, we received 76 return applications. Uh, I must say that usually uh, the statistic was uh, a little bit different. Uh, different. Uh, we mostly, we, we usually receive uh, more return applications uh, uh, as regards return from Ukraine to abroad. Uh, because of the war, the situation crucially uh, has changed. Uh, also, uh, we would, I would like to say that uh, we also mentioned the tendency of increasing of the access applications. Uh, for example, uh, during the first half of this year, uh, we forwarded 43 access applications for abroad. Uh, the main ground for this is uh, that uh, one year period foreseen by Article uh, 12 has elapsed and uh, many applicants decided to change uh, uh, their first uh, desire and not to submit the return application, but rather to submit the access application. Uh, for example, in 2021, we uh, forwarded only seven access applications. So, as you see, uh, the war influences on the general uh, tendencies as regard to the access and return applications. And uh, I should also men mention that uh, uh, in 2022, of course, uh, we, have, uh, we didn't have too much return applications as regard to re return of the child from Ukraine abroad. But uh, from the beginning of this year, the number of uh, the applications a little bit increased and uh, we have such applications. For example, we have already received 12 return applications uh, on the return of the child from Ukraine. 
Uh, as uh, regard to the geography of the applications, it is clear that it's uh, the European states, uh, the states of the EU, Poland, Germany, but we also have applications uh, from such states as uh, United States of America, Canada, Mexico, Norway, Denmark, different uh, states of, of the world. As the Central Authority, the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine informs citizens on a daily basis on the requirements to the documents which are necessary to initiate uh, the proceeding under the abduction convention. Uh, and uh, nowadays, special attention is drawn to the provisions of Article 12 of the convention. In particular, uh, we are talking about a one year period. Uh, the position of the uh, Central Authority of the uh, requested state is uh, that the return application should be forwarded to the competent court before one year period has elapsed. Uh, I will uh, talk about this uh, period uh, later. Important to solve the issue amicably, including uh, through the mediation, uh, which is in the best interest of the child, and of course, on possibility to apply with the access application. Uh, as a central authority, uh, we uh, does not forward applications to Russia and Belarus. It's clear, uh, but uh, we provided we provide information on the possibility to apply directly to the court in this state. Uh, as regard to the applications, I would like to make several remarks. Um, the list of uh, supported documents uh, con um, uh, confirming the application uh, should include inter alia uh, uh, the authorization under Article 28. Uh, we ask uh, the applicants to sign this uh, authorization personally and uh, the consent to uh, processing the personal data uh, of the applicant and the minors. Uh, we uh, elaborated a special form and uh, also always require, uh, requires the applicants to uh, sign this uh, form. And also the documents confirming the children's habitual residence uh, in the requesting state. Uh, I would like to point uh, that uh, all the documents should be uh, combined with the translation uh, in Ukrainian language uh, when we are talking about the incoming cases and on the foreign language of the state, uh, of the requested state, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, the outgoing uh, applications. Uh, we always explain and uh, to our applicants uh, about the language requirements and uh, about uh, how they should, uh, or in, which, in which language the application should be translated. Uh, the translation shall be affirmed by the red seal and the signature of a translator. We accept uh, the documents uh, in electronic form. Uh, we ask them to be sent uh, in PDF format uh, and accept uh, the documents via email. Uh, of course, uh, we all understand the decision on return of the child is made by the court. Uh, and uh, it is uh, clear that the court uh, have different opinions on whether the child has already been settled uh, and uh, as we're, for example, talking about the requirement of Article 12, uh, because in many cases, unfortunately, uh, because of the uh, duration of the stay of the child abroad and duration of the war, uh, that uh, in many cases, uh, more than one year uh, has already passed since the date of departure. Uh, we all, uh, all understand that the children uh, usually uh, was removed uh, on the beginning of March, of 2022. So uh, when parents, for example, uh, when one of the left behind parents applies to us, um, for example, now, even now, uh, we are talking about uh, the situation when uh, the one year period of article foreseen by Article 12 um, has already passed. So uh, the foreign courts, um, in most cases, in initiated during uh, the last year. Uh, rejected on return under uh, part 1 uh, B article 13 of the abduction convention. Uh, and under our experience, we see that it is very important to mention in the application on the return uh, the date of removal and or retention. Uh, 
so as I mentioned, many central authorities of foreign states uh, consider this one year period of time uh, from the date of uh, removal. And uh, usually very um, formally uh, use this uh, period. So uh, for example, German central authority considers that the case should be submitted to the court before uh, this date. Uh, but uh, in many cases, uh, the child, uh, the children were uh, moved to abroad with the consent of the left behind parents. But it was at the beginning. And uh, as the rules of the cross, crossing the state border were changed, uh, no uh, notary uh, consent uh, was necessary. So uh, we very often uh, try to um, explain that uh, in this particular case uh, uh, took place not the wrongful uh, removal, but rather wrongful retention. Uh, so it is very important to uh, provide uh, evidences uh, that uh, despite the removal of the child could be conceded as uh, not wrongful, but uh, the retention of the uh, child uh, is wrongful should be considered as wrongful. And the date of the removal and retention are not uh, uh, the same date as uh, uh, the date of the removal is not the same as the date of the retention. Uh, so um, um, sometimes it is, uh, of course, uh, of course, each case has, uh, uh, in each case, it depends on the situation. And in some cases, uh, it is very difficult to uh, prove uh, this uh, temporary, uh, whether the removal and retention has temporary character. Very often, uh, the children is, um, and the, the, the one of the parents took the child from one state to another state and then to the third state. So uh, it's uh, uh, very important to uh, see the city, to, to, to check the situation and to understand uh, where was the place of habitual residence of the child when took place the wrongful uh, removal or retention and uh, whether it was a retention or a wrongful removal and uh, to determine the date of this uh, uh, starting of this event and uh, to understand better to use Article 12 uh, uh, and to understand whether the Part 1 of Article B is applicable or Part 2 of Article 12 is applicable. Uh, <clears throat> one of the new uh, features of the uh, last year is uh, that uh, we received the application uh, on return of the child uh, from Ukraine uh, to the state uh, to which it was display, uh, displaced after the beginning of the war. Uh, and uh, one of the parents with this child uh, received uh, the uh, temporary protection under EU directive in uh, EU state. And for us, it is, it is a quite confusing situation uh, because we all understand that the state of habitual residence of uh, this child should be uh, considered Ukraine, uh, but the left behind parent requires return to the state uh, in which um, they were, for example, even uh, more than a year, but uh, uh, in each case, it should be considered whether the state becomes the state of habitual residence, whether the child is settled in its new environment, uh, whether Article 12 could be applicable and other articles of the abduction convention. Of course, as I mentioned, uh, we all understand that one year period of time has already elapsed. And this is a, a quite serious argument for the courts to, uh, to refuse in return of the child. But uh, as I said, in each uh, case should be uh, considered whether the child is settled, uh, whether the new environment is uh, could be considered as a, a new place of habitual residence for this particular child or the child uh, was is in so-called bubble environment and uh, uh, this new state uh, not the center of his or her life uh, for example uh, we know about such cases when the child uh, even um, 
don't know if the child doesn't know language or has some problems with the school attendance, etc., etc., and all uh, the communication of the child is concentrated uh, uh, with the mother, for example, or father, or some relatives, or Ukrainian environment, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned also that uh, foreign courts uh, refused, uh, very often refused, uh, unfortunately, to return the child. Uh, and the main argument was uh, the war, of course. Uh, the court uh, apply uh, part 1b article 13 of the abduction convention. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, the situation began to change. Uh, we already have uh, th three uh, return decisions, uh, court return decisions. Uh, so uh, the court uh, in, each particular, in each particular case uh, considers uh, the uh, circumstances and evidences and decide on the merits. Um, for example, recently, um, as uh, I mentioned, we have three return cases. Also, uh, uh, the court uh, approved the amicable agreements uh, of the parents in six cases. Uh, the applicants uh, withdraw seven applications and the court refused the return in 11 cases. Uh, so I would like to mention about this uh, amicable agreement uh, when the court uh, approve, uh, approves uh, such amicable agreement. For example, we have uh, recently uh, we received information uh, that um, it was enforced uh, the court order on, uh, by, uh, by which it was, was improved uh, the amicable agreement of the parents. And this amicable agreement uh, actually foreseen that uh, the child should be returned to Ukraine after the end of the war or not later than July 2023. Uh, so unfortunately, the war um, didn't end, but uh, the child, according to this uh, court decision, German court decision on approval of amicable agreement of the parents, uh, returned in July uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, uh, we believe that it is important that our ministry informs uh, uh, constantly the central authority about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, we always refer to the uh, order of the Ministry of Reintegration of Temporary Occupied Territories of Ukraine, uh, which determine uh, these territories which are uh, warfare or were conducted uh, uh, or which are under temporary occupation. Uh, and uh, we believe that the uh, central authorities and the courts abroad, they um, consider each particular case and uh, arguments of the parties and the evidences and also took, in, took into account our information on the case. Uh, so, um, uh, some also some remarks concerning the incoming cases. I would ju just like to remind that uh, uh, the central authority we conduct all measures which are foreseen by the uh, order of operation of the convention in Ukraine. Uh, but in case uh, the applicant has a lawyer or the state of origin of the applicant uh, made reservation under Article 26 of and 42 of the convention. Uh, uh, and on the principle of reciprocity, we do not represent the interests of such applicants in the court. Uh, so uh, I would like only just to remind uh, this information. Uh, so uh, maybe this is uh, all the information I would like to point on Article uh, 9 on, on Convention on Abduction Convention. Uh, I would like to mention about 1996 Protection Convention, only a few words for your attention. Uh, I, I just would like to point that from the 1st of January of this year, uh, Ministry of Justice of Ukraine is no longer a central authority for this convention. Uh, the National Social Service of Ukraine is the central authority for the convention. 
uh, we consider this convention is very important during the um, this situation we have and taking into account the fact that a lot of uh, children are abroad now, uh, including the children uh, in difficult, uh, uh, difficult, in difficult life circumstances, uh, orphans, uh, uh, children placed in the child care protection institutions, and uh, uh, family type of advantage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, before uh, the first of January, we deal also with the uh, we dealt also with the applications under this convention and uh, provided assistance to the center, to the competent uh, child protection authorities as in Ukraine and also abroad. And in this regard, I would like to point that uh, very often um, uh, uh, parents uh, or Пані Марія, я перепрошую, у нас таймінг, я буду дуже вдячний, якщо ви вже зможете передати слово наступному спікеру і буквально... Only a few words regarding this convention, I would like to say that our parents, custodians, they need a very often assistance abroad of the lawyers as regard to the confirmation of their power or deciding different issues regarding the representation of their interests in the child protection institution of the state, uh, the state where they are now. Uh, this is the main, main general remarks concerning the, our challenges during this uh, period of time. Uh, I hope this information will be useful. We are often very, we are open for the communication and uh, in case you have questions, uh, you can send them to our emails and communicate and to discuss a particular case and particular documents, etc. Thank you for your attention. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pani Maria, for your uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, speech. And uh, it was very detailed and it contain, contains definitely very important uh, points and it was really valuable. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Olga Stupak, judge of the Cassation Civil Court of the Supreme Court. She has a real interest in the Hague Children's Conventions and is one of the main driving forces in Ukraine pushing towards the duly application in our jurisdiction. Olga Vyacheslavovna, прошу до слова. Доброго дня, колеги. В першу чергу хочу подякувати організаторам за те, що сьогодні всіх зібрали. Ви бачите, навіть тривоги не лунають. Дякувати Богу, так як вчора у нас був важкий день в Україні. Дякую нашим іноземним друзям, в першу чергу, за вашу моральну підтримку в Україні і не тільки. З огляду на те, що часу мало для виступу, я коротко про... Розкажу про ті основні проблеми, з якими ми прогнозуємо, що будуть стикатись національні суди, оскільки застосовуючи Гагську конвенцію про запобіганню міжнародному викраденню дітей в мирний час, українські суди розглядали переважно справи про повернення дітей, які перебувають в Україні, і повернення їх в інші країни іноземні, як місце постійного проживання. Трішки статистики для ілюстрації. З початку роботи Верховного суду, який є у нас судом третьої інстанції, всього близько 60 справ цієї категорії було розглянуто касаційним цивільним судом у складі Верховного суду. Вже в воєнні роки, 22-й рік, лише сім таких справ розглянув касаційний цивільний Вільний суд. І у цьому році, 23-му, не дивлячись на те, що вже більше половини року сплинуло, лише одну таку справу розглянув касаційний цивільний суд. І е, підхід був зрозумілий. Але от вирішуючи одну із справ, ще у 21-му році я зараз е, спробую розгорнути презентацію. Так, хвилиночку, щоб... Щось я, як завжди, поспішила і 
Так, бачите вже, вона в мене така велика, ну, щоб органі, учасники змогли ознайомитись потім з нею. Але на прикладі однієї із справ, яку ми розглядали хоча й в 22-му році, але ви бачите, вона справа була ініційована в 19-му ще році, тобто до війни, ми стикнулись з нетиповою ситуацією. Коли заявник, батько, українець звернувся з заявою про повернення дітей за Гавською конвенцією саме в Національний суд України – в той час, як діти перебували за кордоном. За обставинами справи він а, свого часу своїй дружині надав дозвіл на тимчасову поїздку мами з дітьми а, на той час ще до Російської Федерації для того, щоб відвідати родичів. Але, а, звертаю вашу увагу, такий дозвіл був тимчасовим. Мама поїхала і з закінченням строку цього дозвілу не повернулася в Україну і не повернула дітей. Більше того, вона з території Російської Федерації перемістилась в третю країну, на думку батька, це у Вірменію. І е, звернувшись до українського суду з такою заявою про повернення дітей з-за кордону, за правилами Гагської конвенції 80-го року, на жаль, Суди першої апеляційної інстанції відмовили заявнику в задоволенні позову з посиланням на те, що він звернувся, по суті, не до того суду, тобто не до суду тієї країни, де сьогодні перебувають діти. Ми провели багато часу в дискусіях серед своїх колег, і це перша справа на сьогодні, ви бачите, в якій Верховний суд скористався процедурою запиту до постійного бюро Гавської конвенції з міжнародного приватного права. Для того, щоб отримати якісь роз'яснення по застосуванню і співвідношенню застосування конвенції 80-го року, і конвенції 1996 року про юрисдикцію, вам відомо, що застосовуються при визнанні, виконанні та співробітництві щодо батьківської відповідальності та заходів захисту дітей. І, по суті, ось ця справа, в ній детально розписаний алгоритм і для національних судів, і мені цікаво буде почути думку наших міжнародних колег, чи так само вони розуміють це поєднання застосування правил двох конвенцій – в питанні визначення юрисдикції такого спору, тобто суд якої держави є компетентним вирішити заяву заявника про повернення дітей. І а, в цій справі ми сформулювали висновки з урахуванням рекомендацій і роз'яснень наданих постійним бюро Гагської конференції про те, що Тут в мене інші є деталі, але я запонюсь на, якраз на питанні визначення юрисдикції про те, що обидві конвенції є доповненням одна одної і не, не перешкоджають застосовувати правила конвенції 80-го року при визначенні юрисдикції, не, цьому не перешкоджають правила конвенції 1996 року. І, по суті, висновок ми зробили такий, що а, заявник може звернутися не тільки до суду, ну я тут не буду, щоб довго повторюватись, а і до компетентного органу договірної держави, як в країні місця постійного проживання дітей, якщо ця, цей суд, ця країна ще зберігає за собою юрисдикцію, так і до компетентного органу чи суду країни, перебування дітей на момент подання такої заяви. І для цього от, е, на одному із слайдів, ви бачите, я його зараз е, демонструю на екрані, е, Верховний суд, е, застосовуючи правила цих двох конвенцій у їх співвідношенні, сформулював висновок про те, е, якраз, що і національні суди України зберігають компетенцію для вирішення таких заяв, заяв про повернення дітей за Акською конвенцією 80-го року, 
року, якщо в іншій країні теперішнього перебування для діти не набули місця постійного проживання чи звичайного перебування. І якщо підсумувати всі висновки, до чого зводиться рішення у цій справі Верховного суду, то ви бачите, я так зробила схематично про те, що куди може звернутися заявник з відповідною заявою. Перше, це органи країни звичайного місця проживання дитини або країни фактичного перебування. І відповідно і в першій країні, і в іншій країні це можуть бути національні органи, але якщо звернення відбувається через відповідний компетентний національний орган, ну у нас це Міністерство юстиції, то цей орган звертається до компетентного органу країни перебування дитини і у разі недосягнення згоди мирним врегулюванням національний орган договірної держави, де фактично перебуває дитина, вже там в суді ініціює цей спір. Так само в країні звичайного місця проживання може заявник і звернутися до національного суду, що по суті відбулося от в цій справі, про яку я вам розповідаю. Але в цій ситуації заявники, відповідно юристи, які супроводжують ці справи, повинні розуміти, що отримання рішення національного суду буде передбачати е, проходження процедури в країні фактичного перебування дитини, Такої процедури, як визнання і надання дозволу на виконання. І, відповідно, бачите, тут у мене цими стрілочками це позначено. Так само, якщо звернення відбувається в країні фактичного перебування, чи то в національний орган, чи то в суд, якщо суд іноземної держави постановить відповідне рішення і потрібно буде його виконувати на території України, так само потрібно буде пройти процедуру в Національному суді України. Ось це схематично, до чого зводяться висновки в цій справі, але ключовим моментом для визначення юрисдикції є визначення країни постійного місця проживання до моменту незаконного переміщення дитини. І саме тут ми, як Верховний суд, бачимо недоліки в роботі наших судів першої апеляційної інстанції, оскільки не вдаються до детального встановлення обставин справи суди, їх аналізу для того, щоб встановити, а яка ж країна була місцем постійного чи звичайного проживання дитини, до моменту незаконного переміщення. Які нові правові проблеми принесла нам війна? Дотично про них вже говорила Марія, і я думаю, що це буде така група питань, яку доведеться вирішувати правникам не тільки українським, а й нашим міжнародним колегам. Це про те, чи можна оцінювати як незаконне переміщення дитини факт виїзду дітей за кордон на початку повномасштабного вторгнення країни-агресора на територію України у лютому 2022 року. Ми з вами знаємо, що у нас порядок перетину державного кордону для громадян України, який був чинним і на 24 лютого 2022 року, передбачав, що неповнолітня дитина може виїхати у супроводі там, або одного з батьків, або не обов'язково батьків, але обов'язково за нотаріальної згоди батьків. І ми знаємо, що 24 лютого 2022 року, по суті, без внесення відповідних змін в нормативні документи і порядок перетину державного кордону, Державна прикордонна служба України фактично відкрила кордони і діти виїжджали в супроводі, бо от з ким могли, з, тим, з тим і їхали. І тільки у березні 2022 року, а точніше 3 березня, були внесені зміни в цей порядок перетину державного кордону, де зазначено, що дитина, яка не досягла 16 років, може перетинати кордон у супроводі одного з батьків, бабусі, дідуся, там сестри брата повнолітніх або іншої сторонньої людини за письмовою згоди одного з батьків.
Тобто, не дивлячись на те, що ось такі зміни були внесені, ну, ми детально ситуацію не аналізували, тому що не було якраз таких справ, але я думаю, що продовжувався дотримуватися ну, Державною прикордонною службою той підхід, що діти виїжджали от ски ким в них була нагода. І знову ж таки, ще одні зміни вже воєнного часу у квітні 22-го року були внесені, які підтвердили можливість виїзду дитини за кордон у супроводі, але окреслено, що це в період дії воєнного стану. Тому одне з ключових правових питань, яке постане, на сьогодні ще, на жаль, судова практика національних судів на нього не дала відповіді, чи можна отакий виїзд дитини в початок, після початку повномасштабного вторгнення країни-агресора кваліфікувати як незаконне переміщення кордону. Так само, чи можна говорити про те, що якщо на той час була мовчазна згода, наприклад, одного з батьків і дитина з кимось виїхала, а потім, коли вже сьогодні е зі сплином більше ніж року після початку війни там, Інший з батьків передумав, умовно кажучи, і може заперечувати перебування дитини за кордоном і вимагати і просити дитину сюди повернути. Тобто, коли от почнеться цей період незгоди чи період так само незаконного вже перебування за кордоном, це ті правові питання, які нам в майбутньому доведеться е, національній е, судовій системі вирішувати. На сьогодні більшість справ, які доводиться розглядати судам національним, пов'язаним з захистом прав дітей, які знаходяться за кордоном, це спори про встановлення способів участі у вихованні дитини та спілкуванні з дитиною того з батьків, хто залишився в Україні в той час, як дитина перебуває за кордоном. І безумовно судова практика в зв'язку з цими подіями зазнала докорінність, змін. Ми почали встановлювати ми це суди, такі способи участі, як зобов'язання того з батьків, хто перебуває з дитиною за кордоном, забезпечити спілкування засобами мобільного зв'язку, інтернет-зв'язку з тим з батьким, хто перебуває в Україні. Продовжуються спори стосовно визначення місця проживання дітей в тому числі і в той час, коли дитина перебуває за кордоном. Так само судами національними застосовуються заходи забезпечення позовів у таких категоріях справ, наприклад, і в тому числі зобов'язати іншому з батьків, хто перебуває з дитиною за кордоном, надавати можливість телефонного зв'язку там з іншим з батьків. От така на сьогодні ситуація, з якою працюють національні суди, але підсумовуючи, можу сказати одне. Я думаю, що після ось такого висновку Верховного суду ми прогнозовано очі... мож... можемо оч... очікувати появу більшої кількості справ саме в українських національних судах про повернення дітей, які зараз перебувають за кордоном. Так, да, потім залишиться прогнозована частина процедурного питання визнання і виконання цих рішень за кордоном, але я думаю, що це так само реальний шлях в регулювання таких спорів. І в тому числі на сьогодні національні суди готові і продовжувати розглядати заяви про визнання і виконання рішень іноземних судів так само, якщо буде стояти питання про повернення чи з України кудись дитини, чи в Україну. Але, будучи реалістами, я думаю, що ми всі сьогодні розуміємо, і тут для мене важлива думка наших міжнародних колег, 
Сьогодні в Україні розуміння є таке, що немає жодного безпечного місця на території України для того, щоб повернути зараз під час війни дитину в Україну. І це, по суті, складає ті підстави, передбачені пунктом Б частини першої статті 13 конвенції. І тому тут важливо нам почути вашу думку, шановні колеги, чи так само ви розумієте? Можливо, тут у нас ми якісь дуже ну, сильні бачимо перестороги в цьому питанні. Чи все ж таки, от, який ваш погляд там, з цієї сторони? Дуже дякую за наданий час, готова відповісти на питання. Так, дуже дякуємо, Ольга В'ячеславівна, за вашу доповідь. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, next speaker. Yes, Alice. Thank you. I had to go back to the English. You said to me, right, Alex? Okay. Um, thank you. That, that was very interesting and, and certainly understanding what's actually happening on the ground in Ukraine is so important for the rest of us who aren't there and understanding what's happening, but we only see it necessarily on the news or hear about it. But we do have practitioners here who are working in, in countries on cases that involve Ukrainian children. So um, now we're going to turn to the issue of mediation of cases involving the return of children. Um, to Ukraine, and I'm going to introduce Alison Shalaby, who is the CEO of Reunite. Um, she started in 1991 as a volunteer uh, and has been the CEO since 2010. Um, it, see, Reunite is a leading NGO specializing in the international movement of children. They have a variety of um, things that they do regarding um, the International Movement of Children, they have an advice line, they've developed preventative initiatives, they raise awareness and research, they engage foreign governments. Um, and what we're going to talk about now is they also promote mediated solutions regarding um, the movement of children. And so without further ado, I introduce Alice and Shalaby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for inviting me. I think if we're going to talk about um, mediation in these cases, we would certainly look at it in the context of the cases that we're seeing through our advice line. So our advice line, telephone advice line is open to parents anywhere in the world of any nationality. And in the last year, we have actually been seeing Ukrainian parents from Ukraine contacting the advice line um, to explain that their children have been either wrongfully removed from Ukraine or wrongfully retained outside of Ukraine. So at the moment, we have ongoing cases of abduction, retention from Ukraine to Canada, to Jersey, to Germany, to Egypt, to Poland, clearly to England and Wales, and then going the other way, we have abductions from Croatia into Ukraine, from England and Wales into Ukraine. And we speak with both the left behind parent and also the abducting or retaining parent. So we see it from both sides of the coin, as it were. And there is a real sense that parents are using the war as an opportunity to get the children into a country where they actually have always wanted those children to be and where they've never had that opportunity be before. The other thing that we are seeing sadly is that left behind parents are being told by solicitors um, that a return to the Ukraine is very unlikely due to the situation in Ukraine, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to hear going forward um, some of the, the case law in these cases with Ukraine, because I'm hoping to hear about really strong case law 
that children are being returned. And I think that message has to get out to parents involved in these cases, because parents whose children have been abducted from Ukraine are giving up hope or they may be changing the position that they really want simply based on incorrect information that they are being given. So I think it's it's a priority, certainly for the legal profession to share any findings um, with other solicitors so that parents are actually given correct information. What we're also seeing is cases of abduction into Ukraine Prior to the war, we're seeing a lot of voluntary returns of those children, both voluntary returns of the children back to England or back to other countries to get the children out of the, the, the desperate situation that is happening over there now. But when we look at mediation, I think one of the things that is particularly hindering any form of negotiation in these Ukrainian cases is this total belief that no judge will return a child to Ukraine while the war is going on. And so, of course, for the abducting or retaining parent, they don't believe that they have to move on their position at all because they feel that ultimately, whatever happens, if it goes to court, no judge is going to make that decision to return their children. So we have mediated in a handful of cases um, where either this, the originating country or the final country is Ukraine, because we mediate in and outgoing cases. And I think it comes down to what is your de definition of a successful mediation? Is a successful mediation that parents absolutely reach an agreement on where these children are going to live? Or is a successful mediation after is it that after so many months of the parents not talking, they're actually now communicating, they are thinking about both scenarios, should the children return, should the children remain, they're discussing all sorts of aspects of those scenarios, but they can't actually reach a decision on which country the children live with. So whilst we are mediating, um, we get, we're seeing very few actual agreements. It is being left to the court. Unfortunately, with some of these cases, there is a huge time delay going through the Hague proceedings, which isn't helpful to anybody. Um, but really mediation can be used in these cases with, without a war, because it's down to the parents. It's a voluntary process. It's about parents being willing to come to the table and discuss things. Most mediations these days, certainly our mediations, are undertaken remotely through Zoom. Because of the pandemic, most parents, the same as most businesses, the same as most of us being here, we are very used now to things being done remotely. And even though we try and encourage parents to travel, to have face-to-face -face mediation, they're giving the same answer as, as everybody else in every other aspect of life. Well, why do we have to travel? We have Zoom. You know, it's good enough to be able to mediate and talk via Zoom. So that is a very quick, brief sort of tour of what we're seeing through our advice line. Our, and the mediation, our biggest concern though is that parents whose children have been removed from Ukraine are being given incorrect information. And that's something that really I would hope that we would be able to address to give Ukrainian parents hope that yes, their children may return home. I know that we are overrun quite significantly so far. Um, so I will leave it at that. Quite happy to take any questions or discuss anything further, um, but I'll keep my intervention at the moment brief. Thank you very much. So, Alison, thank you so much. I, I have a question just in your experience. I, I do mediation in my practice as well, and I do find that um, the Zoom mediation is not as effective, I think, I like the phrase that Michelle Obama used, it's hard to hate up close. Um, and when you can get two people in a room across a table, 
Um, there's the, a lot more work can be done. Do you find more success in the face-to-face -face mediation than you do in Zoom mediation or in your, in your experience, in your cases, is it equal or what are you finding? It's equal. Um, and even prior to the pandemic, we were so used to mediating remotely anyway, because of course you've always got two parents um, in different countries. And we're very fortunate in the UK that our legal aid will actually pay for the overseas parent to travel to the UK to mediate face to face. And we would be offering this to all parents. We'll pay for your flights, we'll pay for your hotels, we'll pay for your train fare. Please come and mediate face to face because we prefer it face to face. I think it's easier to control and manage all the emotions when you're face to face. Um, but I don't think it makes any difference to the outcome. I think the only thing that makes a difference to the outcome is the parents themselves and their actual willingness and desire to want to reach an agreement. I think very often we talk about parents come to mediation to talk about the best interests of their children. And I think in the abduction cases, they don't. They come with their own needs and wants. And if those needs and wants are met, then they are very willing to make an agreement. But if their needs and wants aren't met, um, then it, they don't. So I don't believe that remote or face-to-face -face makes a difference. I think it's just down to the parents. It's the parents that make the difference. Thank you so much. Anybody have any other questions for her at this time? I'm sure there'll be questions at the end. And I have a dozen questions, but I also know we have a time limit. <laughs> so thank you so much, Allison. Um, our, our next speaker, uh, who's going to speak on recent case law, is someone quite familiar to me. Um, because full disclosure, he is the senior vice chair of the Family Law Committee of the International Bar Association. Uh, and his name is attorney Stephen Cullen. He's also the principal and head of family law and private client group at Miles and Stockbridge PC in Washington, DC. And uh, he's going to speak with us about recent case law. So without further ado, attorney Cullen. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning, Ukraine. I feel like it's the Eurovision song contest here. And uh, the Kalush Orchestra is in the background. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I want to, being Scottish, want to get us back on our timetable. That's a very Scottish phenomenon. I know someone else will probably say that too from Scotland in a minute. So I'm going to abbreviate uh, what I have to say. And let me just uh, go through my... Um, program for you. Hold on. Okay, so there are an enormous number of Hague cases in the United States. And part of the reason for that is there are so many international families in uh, America, including uh, this guy here, Prince Harry, obviously, he's now living here. But we have an enormous number of international families. One thing I want to just mention very briefly is, although the talk today is about The Hague, don't forget in America, we have other options. We have a state uh, statute that is able to register and enforce foreign orders. And we have Im immigration law that can also deal with these uh, issues in, in a slightly different way. So in America, what do we have? We have obviously the treaty, and then we have an enabling statute in the United States. Then we have the state statute, and then we have immigration law. Now, if we get to the Hague Convention, what you heard Elise say at the beginning is that we have several very important uh, policies behind it. Up until recently in America, the view was that uh, the most important part of the treaty was to return children as soon as possible. 
mollified by recent case law. And there's more recognition now that the whole purpose of the treaty, the welfare of children, uh, also has to be balanced in talking about. We're talking about grave risk to a child, physical or psychological harm, intolerable situation. In America, under our enabling statute, if the taking parent is trying to advance that defense, they have to do it by the clear and convincing evidence standard, which is a higher standard than what is usually used in civil litigation. Normally, it's a preponderance of the evidence standard. So it is a very high bar. In passing, I just want to mention that there have been numerous attempts in America in cases also to advance Article 20, the human rights violation. I see two of my friends, Richard Min and Melissa Kaczynski, are watching this today. They may know this better than me, but I believe it's never been successfully advanced. It's been uh, talked about in several cases. There may be one case uh, where it has been advanced in state court, but I do not know of any federal cases that's ever accepted in Article 20. So we have grave risk. Now, what happens with grave risk in the context of war? So there are a couple of old cases, and this case, Friar here, was addressing unrest in Israel in 1996. And the unrest was very close to where the family home was. And what Fryer said was, if you're talking about returning children to a zone of war or to a famine or disease, then uh, that may be a situation where return is not permitted. But in Fryer, the return was permitted anyway. Now, what's very interesting, if we look back over COVID, uh, from 2021 into 2022, there were numerous attempts by taking parents to say, well, obviously you cannot return children to, say, northern Italy, where the situation was particularly bad at the beginning of COVID, or to other countries which were going through particularly bad stages of COVID. My experience was that is that was rejected outright by almost all the courts that dealt with that position. And it's an analysis that I think you could be making with a return to Ukraine. I mean, we were talking about the worst pandemic in any of our lifetimes, and time and again, the federal courts returned children over and above the pandemic and ignored the disease situation that existed for over two years. So there was another famous case or infamous case called Silverman in 2003, where the trial court did decide that Israel was a war zone and did not return to Israel. But that was overruled by the appeal court. Uh, the appeal court said a general regional violence and suicide bombers uh, does not amount to a war zone and order the return to Israel. Now, what have people been using in cases involving alleged war zones? Well, typically people go to the State Department travel warnings. And over the years, people have tried to use the travel warnings involving Venezuela and El Salvador and very early on Northern Ireland when there were some particularly terrible uh, bombings in Oma in Northern Ireland as reasons not to return to those countries. By and large, those were um, uh, not accepted or those positions were used by mature children as their basis for saying they didn't want to go back to uh, their requesting country. So are there any Ukraine cases? Well, it's interesting. There are Four that I could find, but you'll see the dates of these, 2010, 2011, 2017, and 2018. Uh, although the war in the East had obviously begun, in all four of these cases, including the 2018 case, all the children were returned to Ukraine. 
uh, in some cases over and above the objection of a mature child. So the situation in America is very fluid right now. It seems to me that one would use the pandemic as, as an analysis as to why return should still happen. And with that, keeping in mind the time we're on, I'm going to stop there and uh, glory to Ukraine. Dear Ellis, you are mute. You would think it was my first time on Zoom, Alex. It's my first time. Um, thank you so much, Stephen. We appreciate that update on this on the case law. Um, our next speaker is also here in the U.S. His name is Preston Finlay, and he is legal counsel to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, affectionately known as NICMEC. Uh, he provides legal and technical assistance and training regarding international and domestic abductions. Uh, he's also edited and co-authored NICMEC's litigation guide for attorneys handling cases under the Hague Child Abduction Convention. And I, we welcome Preston. Thank you very much, and um, thank you everyone for for having me. I will also keep my um, remarks fairly brief and just share, you know, the experience of our center. Um, we we are a non governmental and non profit organization that assists parents and families, and we receive reports of family abductions from across the country and. Um, uh, children who are also taken across borders. Most of our experience with international cases, and um, when I say experience, I'm referring to about seven or eight thousand total cases in our in our organization's history, and a current active total of approximately 500 active international abductions. Most of that experience we have are with children who've been removed from the United States and taken to another country. Um, this includes approximately 30 uh, children who were removed from the United States and taken to the Ukraine. Uh, and among those cases, uh, we have uh, three uh, children who are still currently actively missing. Um, in each of the active cases we have to the country of Ukraine, um, it is believed, although not confirmed, that each of those taking parents, uh, one father and one mother, um, each have um, now remove the children further to a third country. Um, although again, uh, information is a, a bit sparse and, and uh, their location in, in at least one of those cases has, hasn't been confirmed. Um, our experience with recovered or, or resolved cases to the Ukraine um, indicates a similar trend that we see with, with other countries. And that um, trend has remained consistent, although again, we have a very limited experience with post-war um, war cases in, in the Ukraine. Um, uh, the largest category and by far the most common reason that U.S. children are recovered when taken to the Ukraine is through a mediation or through a voluntary resolution. It is not always a formal legal me mediation with both parties represented by counsel. Sometimes it is an informal negotiation or, or discussion among the parents um, or a, a um, voluntary return on the part of the taking parent. Um, that, that right now um, constitutes 32 percent of our are uh, recovered or resolved cases from the United uh, Ukraine. Uh, the next highest category are Hague returns itself. Uh, we have seen um, uh, Ukraine courts uh, return a significant number of, of children to the United States in, and is something um, that we hope you know, will continue. And, and I'm pleased to hear from, from um, the, the judge uh, earlier who's, who's uh, looking to continue that, that record, which I think is commendable um, and, and is um, comparable or, or in, in some ways a little bit higher than we've seen in other countries in, in the region or, or um, uh, across the um, continent. Um, uh, sadly, uh, this still leaves uh, quite a few cases that are resolved uh, outside of the courts or outside of an amicable uh, resolution. Um, there is a, approximately 10% of the children taken to the Ukraine were only recovered when their searching parent decided to go and re-abduct those children. We, we sometimes refer to that as a self-help return because it does not always involve a forcible taking or a forcible abduction, but that is still reflects a parent who feels that there are no other options and there, there is no legal recourse to recover their child. So they have to act outside of the system. Um, and then a, a small portion of our cases involved uh, children who were recovered by a law enforcement agency when the taking parent maybe traveled, crossed a border or were picked up 
through um, Interpol notices or, or arrest warrants uh, for them uh, as uh, international child abduction remains a crime in the United States under both federal and state law. Um, and sadly, 28% uh, of all children that, that our center has been involved with who were taken to the Ukraine uh, were never recovered at all. Um, contact was, was lost or the um, searching parent was never able to obtain either a return or any meaningful access to their child in that country. Um, you know, each of these results and resolutions uh, uh, indicate some of the practical hurdles that, that parents face and that we hear um, time and time again uh, from U.S. families who are impacted by this issue. Uh, the, the hurdles they face involve uh, first finding and locating their child, which can be increasingly difficult if the authorities are, are um, unable to, to help uh, the parent with locating. Uh, the enormous costs and expense and time and energy that is required to search for their child, to obtain legal help and to travel to recover their child, and the emotional um, burden of reunification with their child. Um, e each of these are, are areas where our center has, has tried to support families. We have a travel program uh, grant to try and send families abroad to pay for the costs of their flights and travel. Um, we have uh, trained uh, counselors and mental health staff who can help a family um, prepare for the uh, connection with their child and prepare for reunification so that it occurs in a in a way that is not traumatic to the child. Um, and of course, our, our center is happy to work with law enforcement agencies or others to help uh, locate children wherever they are um, around the world. Um, so my my um, suggestions and, and recommendations from our center's experience are to um, continue to emphasize uh, the treaty and the court process as the most meaningful and, and beneficial way to resolve a case and, and um, the method that uh, you know, utilizing the courts and the treaty are uh, likely to be the least traumatic for a child and also to lead to the most permanent resolution to the case. It's less likely for a re-abduction or a secondary abduction to occur if um, the parties feel like they are being heard and that their, their um, outcome was adjudicated fairly by the court system. So um, with each of those experiences, I would be happy to fill in more details, but but again, I would just encourage everyone here, and I'm, I'm, I'm personally encouraged by your, your focus on, on trying to maintain access to the courts and maintain access to reasonable decisions uh, for returning children. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Preston. And now I'll turn it over to Alex. Yes, uh, thank you, Alice, and thank you, Stephen, thank you, Preston, for very interesting and important insight into U.S. jurisdiction. And uh, Mr. Richard Mean uh, has kindly informed uh, everybody that uh, actually there was uh, one case on the Article uh, 20 in, in the U.S. jurisdiction. So thank you, Mr. Mean. For, for, for this information. Um, I'm glad to give a floor to the colleague from Canada, uh, Mrs. Farah Houdani, a partner at Barris and Houdani Doris LLP. Uh, she represents Canada today and provides us with a valuable insight on the return of the relocated children to Ukraine open the convention. Please, Farah. Thank you um, so much, uh, Alexander. I appreciate that. Um, so I did look at cases, recent cases in Canada on returns to Ukraine, and there aren't any specific reported decisions in the last 10 years. Certainly there are cases where a child has been removed from Canada to the Ukraine, and um, Alex and I are working on a couple of those right now. Um, uh, but I thought I would spend my time today instead explaining how Canada treats the issue of war under Article 13b of the Convention based upon the Canadian cases. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, Article 13b speaks to the discretionary defense of grave risk if the child were returned, which would expose the child to physical or psychological harm or otherwise place the child in an intolerable situation. According to the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Thompson, the standard for grave risk is that the risk must be grave, weighty, substantial, not trivial, and severe, and the harm must amount to an intolerable situation. And Canada is quite stringent on the Article 13 defenses, and Thompson continues to apply. So for anyone who 
has some familiarity with Canadian cases. There is a more recent Supreme Court of Canada decision called Balov, but Balov didn't actually have anything to do with the risk of harm threshold. It had to do with the habitual residence threshold. So Thompson still continues to apply in terms of the risk of harm threshold. It's very high. It's very stringent. Um, in terms of war, Canadian courts actually often cite the U.S. Court of Appeal decision in Friedrich uh, for clarifying that grave risk of harm for purposes of the Hague Convention can exist when the return of a child puts the child in imminent danger prior to the resolution of a custody dispute, and that imminent danger can include war, famine, or disease. But based upon my review of Cases in Canada dealing with war, specifically under Article 13b, the conclusions, or the, I'll talk about the conclusions or the ratios that can be drawn from those cases, and then I'll, I'll kind of go into the cases. There's three or four that I think are, are somewhat important to know from a Canadian law perspective. So the ratios really, or the, the conclusions that can be drawn from these cases are that um, Canadian courts have found that moving to a country with war but not in a direct active war zone is insufficient to meet the grave risk of harm test. Okay, so that's one conclusion that can be drawn from the cases. The second conclusion that, can, that, that I think can be drawn from the cases that deal with this issue are that the severity of the harm of the situation um, may be met, but the risk of harm can still be insufficient to rise to the level of the Article 13b defense. So the risk of harm can be mitigated by factors such as the child having previously been to the country in the current or similar conditions and returning without issue, or a lack of evidence that the parent would intentionally put the child in a situation that would place the child's life in jeopardy, okay? So, so it's really about constructing the case in that manner, like putting together the affidavit evidence and the expert evidence on those issues. I'll discuss it a little bit more, but but as um, I think it was Alison Shalabi uh, pointed out, I think it's important for uh, people to know and practitioners to know that it is not, you cannot just say there is a war in Ukraine and expect the court to take judicial notice and not order the return. That's, that's not, that is not the way the Canadian courts are looking at this for sure. Um, the onus is still on the party wrongfully retaining the child to show on a balance of probabilities that the child would be exposed to harm or otherwise place the child in an intolerable situation um, if returned. So in terms of the cases, the Alberta Court of Appeal, in, and I can, I can put in the sites in the um, chat function, I can put in the case sites to the extent that anyone wants those, I can do that or, or send an email around. But the Alberta Court of Appeal in Brill, that's 2010 Alberta Court of Appeal, dismissed an appeal from a decision where a judge had ruled that despite the higher probability of war or terrorist activities in Israel, the child's daily safety was not a significant risk and the child was ordered returned, okay? Um, JS versus RM is another case in 2012, also Alberta. And in that case, they relied on the Brill decision. And now the, the challenge with JS was although the court found, uh, the court ordered, the court did not find that the war or terrorist activity would impact the child's daily safety. And they didn't find that to be a significant risk. And in that case, uh, the other country was East Jerusalem. Um, and the child was of Arab Palestinian descent and, and, and the mother was arguing that because of the Palestinian Israeli tensions over the land in East Jerusalem, uh, that the child should not be returned. And the court didn't find that the, that the daily, that the risk um, to the child's daily safety was sufficient to meet the Article 13b test, but because the child was mature and able to express their own objections, they didn't order the return. But it wasn't, it didn't have to do with the war in and of itself, it was the other component of the Article 13b risk, which was, which was the objection of the mature child. So the next one is GB versus VM. Uh, it's an Ontario case. And in that case, joint custody was granted by a court in Hungary in, in 2005. Um, the mother removes the child to Ontario in 2011. The child was of Roma heritage and the mother was a well-known Roma human rights activist. 
the father applied under Article 12 of the Hague Convention for the return of the child. Um, the application was granted. The mother submitted that the child was at risk of danger because of threats of persecution um, received by activities and the child's Roma heritage and persecution of Roma people by the Hungarian groups. That's what she argued. The court found that conditions in a country that may be more unsettled and pose a greater risk to his re its residents than conditions in Canada is not sufficient to establish the uh, Article 13 be risk of harm. There wasn't enough uh, evidence of the active risk because the child had lived in Hungary for years without issue. The last case that I want to talk about is Vieira versus Dos Santos Trillo, which is um, um, a, a case, an Al another Alberta case, the, the court side of the Alberta case. And um, this was a case where the mother submitted several reasons for not returning to a, ch a child to Brazil, including that the child was at risk to being uh, kidnapped. Brazil was in a violent situation at the time. It would be harmful uh, to return the child to, to Brazil. And still, again, even in that case, um, the mother had adduced evidence from uh, expert, um, experts. Uh, she tried to adduce all kinds of news articles and, and still the child was returned to Brazil again for the same reasons, because there was no, uh, there was no demonstration that the child's daily activity would be at risk of harm. So I, I, I think um, a Canadian court may think differently if a, a child were to be returned to an active war zone, um, but, it, but it's not sufficient uh, to just say, okay, Canada, take judicial notice of the war in Ukraine. Okay, there, it, it, it depends on what side of um, um, the argument you're facing, but in either case, I, I, I think if you're on for the parent that's seeking the return to the Ukraine, um, you need to show, you need to get expert evidence, um, you need to get affidavit evidence, you need to show how the parent is going to demonstrate that the area that the child is in is still safe, or what precautionary measures that you're going to take. But Canada is certainly not going to just not return children because there's an, a, a, a war in Ukraine. And, and certainly I have not seen any trends of that, although I don't, there isn't a specific reported decision on the issue in the last 10 years. The, recent, the trends in the case law do not demonstrate that. It requires more. So um, as um, Allison asked, yes, I, I think it is important for practitioners to, to tell uh, their clients that, that it, it is still worth fighting for, particularly in the country of Canada. Uh, thank you, Farah. It was really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Next is UK jurisdiction, and I do know that it will be uh, very interesting. And as, as there are quite a few cases on return to Ukraine under the convention, uh, this section will be presented by a powerful team of uh, Mrs. Carolina Padrena, a partner of Dawson Cornell LLP and vice president of International Academy of Family Lawyers, as well as. Uh, of uh, Mrs. Laura Coyle, a partner of the Freeman Solicitors and co-vice chair of Child Abduction Lawyers Association. Thank you, Alexander. Um, I'm going to go first, everyone. And I, I would say it has been very interesting listening to um, the other speakers from different jurisdictions. Um, I note particular from what Stephen Cullen said about a uh, conflict in Northern Ireland being relied upon in the past for an Article 13b defence. Um, I grew up 13 minutes away from OMA and was 17 in 1998, which is the, the year of the bomb. So I think that really brings into focus that um, the Hague has continued to be robust and also that we're looking at uh, the situations of children on the ground when applications are being made for return to any country, uh, particularly those with conflict. Um, we have the benefit in the jurisdiction of England and Wales of having three quite recent cases um, looking at uh, applications for return to Ukraine. Um, these cases are all at high court level. So just to clarify, these are decisions which are persuasive on other high court judges, um, but, and I know Carolina is going to talk further on a recent uh, court of appeal decision in a 1996 
Hague case, um, which is a binding decision on, on the lower courts. And in England and Wales, all of our cases start off at high court level. So since 2022, uh, we have had at least three reported cases. Because these cases are reported, they're anonymized as to the particular details. Um, and I'll go on to discuss one in terms of geographical location, uh, where we're not given the precise details of where that return um, is sought to in Ukraine, only told that it's close to the Hungarian border. Um, but what these cases show is that, yes, Article 13b is being pleaded, and usually, by um, the parent who wishes to keep the child uh, in the UK. Um, but it also brings in, into focus a, a number of other aspects, such as arguments on habitual residence. And um, the first case, which is X and Y, um, the issue of a, a return to a third state. Um, return to a third state is something which English lawyers could probably talk for hours upon, um, because in the first particular case, what the judge is being asked to consider is uh, whether following the displacement of a family to Germany and um, the Hague Convention could be utilised not for a return to Ukraine, but for a return to Germany. And the circumstances in that case was that the mother, children and grandmother um, had fled Kiev, um, had gone to Berlin. Uh, the children have been sent on to England to stay with their father on the basis that mother would remain with grandmother while she got a visa to come to the UK. It became very obvious very quickly on that she wouldn't get a visa and therefore the mother requested that the children come back. Father objected in England, issued domestic proceedings after the mother sought advice from a German lawyer uh, and the mother subsequently issued her Hague application. Now the circumstances of that case was that the judge wasn't being asked to return the children to Ukraine. Um, and did make some obiter comments about how perhaps would have struggled if that was the actual application. But what she did find was that the Hague Convention is capable of being used under Article 12 uh, to have a return to the carer um, and a state of non-habitual residence, so in this situation, Germany, um, and also dismiss the consent and acquiescence Article 13a defences advanced by the father on the basis that the mother had only agreed to the temporary relocation um, of her children uh, on the basis that she and grandmother would also join. Um, the judge did actually find an Article 13b defence under child's objections for the eldest child of the sibling group, uh, which is quite surprising because that eldest child was only nine, uh, but exercised her discretion to return. Uh, we then move on to the case of, of Q&R, uh, which is a September 2022 decision. And that was a case where the mother and child had relocated under the visa resettlement scheme to England in April 2022. Shortly thereafter, had um, spoken to father, who was English and living in England, though separately to mother and child, about the prospect of returning back to Ukraine as it was becoming very clear that where her family resided, which was close to the Hungarian border, was actually a very safe area. Again, father objected, made an application under domestic uh, English law for a uh, prohibited steps order to prevent the child being removed onward to Ukraine. And the mother sub subsequently issued her application uh, under the Hague Convention. Father relied on a threefold Article 13b defence um, his habitual residence argument was quickly dispensed with, bearing in mind that the child had only been in the UK since April uh, when this matter actually reached the court and Hague proceedings were issued in the July. But the father's three prong Hague 13b defence was risk of physical harm because of conflict and then risk of psychological harm uh, because the lack of functioning courts in Ukraine um, and their inherent biases towards him uh, would mean that he wouldn't get a fair trial in the event that mother prevented contact. Um, those were uh, resoundingly uh, dismissed by the judge on the basis that uh, Ukraine is of course a signatory to both the 1980 and 1996 Hague Convention and there would be no suggestion that a Ukrainian court would not uphold any application made uh, but in any event mother had always promoted and supported contact. Um, the case of Q&R makes it very, very clear, and Mr. Justice Williams, who was the presiding judge, um, says that we have to look at cases on their specific facts. And he carried out a risk assessment of what life would be like for this particular five-year-old if he was returned to this particular area of Ukraine. 
Um, and he concluded that, firstly, it was an area which was relatively safe. It was an area in which infrastructure was still functioning. Uh, it was not an area of particularly military um, interest. Uh, and more importantly, mother could be relied upon to safeguard the child because at a time when she thought there would be a risk of harm to the child, uh, she was able to quickly leave uh, and travel onwards. And so in that circumstance, uh, there was a return uh, ordered to Ukraine. Um, we then come to the most recent reported case, which is from March this year. This is a, a highly unusual case in that um, the father who was seeking the return to Kiev had actually conceded the Hague by the time it came to the court. But the Deputy High Court judge took it upon himself to give a judgment dealing with the principal as to whether or not, um, in a generic sense, so very, very different to Q&R, which makes it clear that we look at case specifics, um, the case of, of Z, Z, and, Z and X uh, looks at whether, in principle, um, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine is capable of amounting to an Article 13b defence. Um, we aren't giving really much detail about the family situation in this case, uh, save for that the mother and children had left uh, Kiev at the start of the invasion, had travelled to Slovakia, onwards from Slovakia to the UK, and then after a period in the UK, the mother had issued divorce proceedings. Uh, so that had led to the breakdown of the relationship um, which, as we see, happens often in Hague cases, uh, can really kickstart an application made then for return uh, on the basis of a father in Kiev um, was not anticipating or expecting um, that the relationship uh, would then no longer subsist. Um, in the circumstances of that case, what we have is a judge looking at contemporaneous media reports, um, advice from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and also from the, the US government in terms of travel to Ukraine and he concludes that based on the information before him that it is capable to mount a successful article 13b defense uh, in respect of the conflict in Ukraine and um, that particular judge <laughs> comments in the judgment and um, that he has decided to um, set out a judgment which is a reported case uh, on the basis that there are other cases which may involve application for return under Ukraine um, but we are left in the final paragraph of that judgment with a return to the position in Q&R saying that it should be very case specific. Um, and I know Alison and, and the work that Reunite do in, in England and Wales, um, and we definitely do promote and support mediation. And I echo what she says about the importance of the correct legal advice being sent out to parents. And um, what is clear is that the information needs to be provided to the judges as to what life is like for these children. And we have seen it repeatedly through the cases. I think that everyone has mentioned it involving Israel, that there are circumstances where an overarching portrayal of an area of conflict uh, can be taken as read. Um, but there are children living in lots of countries all around the world um, who lead perfectly happy, safe lives um, where there are reports of conflict in, in particular areas. Um, so I, I echo what Alison says about the importance being sent out to Ukrainian parents that all is not lost. And it really is important seeking um, the benefits of, of correct and focused legal advice at the start. Um, I haven't had particular experience of a request made for return under um, the Hague uh, in a Ukrainian case since the start of the conflict. I have dealt with cases prior to the conflict and in one of the cases that uh, me and Alexander both worked on uh, where a return was ordered. Um, but luckily my client was able to, to secure um, leave to remove to come back to the UK um, through the Ukrainian courts. Um, I think Carolina uh, will probably address on her own experiences or more recent experience and, and in particular that Court of Appeal decision. So I'll, I'll hand over to Carolina. Thank, thank you, Laura. Uh, well, uh, first, I agree with Laura today about everything that she has said. This is not common when we are in court, <laughs> but today I agree with her. This is the way that we are dealing with these cases. In, in the UK, we are sending the message out that we are applying with the convention with Ukraine. And we are also dealing with cases with Russia, which I have my own reservations, but we also sending the message that we are applying the convention with them. So uh, before I go into the topic, I want to say thank you to the organizers, the Family Law Committee of the IBA, 
and the Civil and Family Inheritance Committee of the UBA for organizing this uh, event, for putting us together, because we need to send the message out that the Hague Convention 1980 and also the 1996, which is very important in the UK, is applicable with the UK and, and in, in Ukraine. So uh, Laura has been talking to you about the most important cases. I was thinking like, why we have so many cases? The invasion was in February, 2022. Uh, we are a year, past a year from the invasion. I think it was because we were one of the first countries that dealt with the visa scheme. So I think we attract a lot of families immediately because we, uh, maybe one of the benefits of not being in the EU is that we dealt with the visa skin immediately and we welcome a lot of families. Most of the top, most of the facts of those cases is that the mothers were coming with children and the fathers were, they remain in Ukraine because they need to stay over there for, for uh, the obligations to to with the country. So we noticed that it's very, a lot of the cases is like those children are living here when they realize that they can go back to Ukraine, things have settled down in the situation or the family have moved within the Ukraine. They, uh, then the mother doesn't want to return. So uh, we, uh, Laura has dealt with most of the cases with Ukraine. Five of them has been reported. Many of them has not been reported. Most of the cases that we are seeing now is children who came with relatives and the special guardianship agreements between the family that they were not officially approved in Ukraine. So we are dealing with those cases now where those children are here and we want to legalize those uh, foster arrangements. So in hey cases, I think uh, the message has been sent out that we are applying the convention. And as Mr. Justice Williams said, it's case specific. So uh, I will be talking about a case that we dealt with him, with Mr. Justice Williams resolved, and it was with Russia. And he is quite interesting because he used the same terminology that he used for Ukraine. He said, we need to comply with the convention. We are sending these children back to Russia. So it was a family of four, Two of them were retained in the UK when they came for a holiday. This family were meeting in Lithuania because they couldn't travel directly from Russia. So uh, the father retained two of the kids here. One of the kids was 12 years old and nearly 13. He was objecting to return to Russia. The father was using the fact that he wrote articles against the invasion uh, as a risk for the children to live in Moscow. Um, uh, and the, a return order was, was made, even that the child was, uh, it was considered and we conceived that it was objecting to return. When the judge exercised discretion, they sent the children back to, to Russia. On the, what I found interesting professionally is that we continue to use Article 13b when we are referring to, to the invasion of Ukraine and the situation in Russia. Uh, and I agree with uh, when, our colleagues from the USA that we maybe we should be thinking about Article 20 or why we are when are we touching the, the the angle of Article 20 in this situation? But it's interesting that again in this judgment it was only Article 13 referred to to the political situation and the war. So paragraph 87 of the judgment is say so as thin is done and on the evidence before me, what I have said that there is a generic risk to any individual who opposes the Putin regime or is a dissident, particularly those who make public that in the news or by attendance at demonstration, there is nothing which identifies a particular risk to these children. So that's why he was making a return order of the children to Moscow. So um, again, uh, just to remember the Article 13b, uh, the burden of proof is, is in the parent who has removed or retained the child. So in this case, uh, the court uh, concluded that the, the father didn't satisfy uh, the court with that, with the, that the risk was grave, that it was, it was, uh, it will be placing the children in that kind of situation. So uh, that is the message. I think we continue to apply the convention. We should apply the convention, the 1980. But as I said, when I started, for me, the most important one is the 1996, because we, we have a lot of uh, cases of these children that they need to have a status as to why they are here and what is the relationship with the relative that is looking after them. The most important decision, as Laura has anticipated, is from our court appeal only recently from June. And it was a very 
interesting one on jurisdiction. So it was a family living in Ukraine. They left immediately in March, 2022. Mom with the children, they moved initially to Germany. Then from Germany, they had about the visa scheme in England and they come to England with that visa having been granted. Father remained in Ukraine. So when they are in, in England uh, for a few months, they were based in the Midlands. The father arranged, they arranged some kind of holidays. So two of the eldest children go to, with the father to Thailand on holidays. And then from Thailand, the father moved them to Ukraine and retained them in Ukraine. This kind of case is the mother applied for an application under the Hague through the Ukrainian Central Authority in Ukraine. But the father made an application first for a leave with order, a custody application in Ukraine before the mother made any application here. So the issue in this case was, which court have jurisdiction about these children, because these children, whether the children were habitual resident in England, whether it would, whether even if they were habitual resident in England, the Ukrainian courts have jurisdiction because the application has been issued first. So very interesting reading. We can send that to you. We can send you all the cases that we have referred to, Laura and I, in particular these five. I think they are very interesting reading. But the message from our uh, Lord Justice Moylan, who is the head of our international liaison office is that he said that despite the judge below's views of the situation in Ukraine, the court is still needs to adapt to these conventions. And that is the message from the UK. We need to continue to apply these conventions because we are protecting children. So we need to remember we are dealing with private international law. Let's do the public law with the to other individuals. Well, by international private law, we need to defend these conventions and to apply them. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Do you want me to take it from here? Yes. Okay. Please. All right, unless someone has a question at this point. No, Carolina, thank you so much. Laura and Carolina, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we are going to turn to our professional from Scotland. Her name is Seanich Cochrane. She's the senior solicitor from SKO Family Law Specialists. She is heavily engaged in legal cases related to Ukraine since the start of the war. And she smiled because I said her name correctly. And I'm very proud of that fact. Oh, I know. It's a thank you for joining us, Seanich. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks. So it, it was really interesting to hear the other kind of perspectives from England, Canada and the US. And I must say quite a, a lot of what's been said is similar to what I'll say. Um, so Scotland and England are often considered to be the same, but we are different jurisdictions, we're different legal systems and we do approach things differently to, to England in many situations. Um, English case law is not binding on Scotland, but it is something that we um, we sort of find quite persuasive. So um, the, the cases that have been mentioned by Laura and Carolina are all um, quite relevant to, to what I'm going to say. Um, so in Scotland, we haven't had any reported cases dealing with the specific question of whether there should be return order to Ukraine since the war began. Um, but the, the sort of general trend of, of Scottish cases and international abduction kind of do, do give an idea of what the court would likely um, do um, in, in, in a case of this type. Um, so the, the, the Hague Conventions incorporated into Scotland by the Child Abduction and Custody Act 1985 um, and our court's approach in dealing with these is by summary proceedings so it's a, a much kind of quicker process um, than, than a, a normal case um, so there's no oral evidence in these cases just written statements and in some cases you don't get the chance for witnesses to respond to each other. And, and that should make for a quick process, but we've, we have had a number of Hague cases which have taken quite a long time um, to reach a decision, sometimes over nine months, um, so that the court do kind of balance the need for speed with the detailed analysis of each situation. And I think that's even more important when you're dealing with um, these cases involving Ukraine, um, because you do need that detailed analysis to work out what the situation actually is, rather than taking any blanket rule for any country or situation. Um, and I think 
in a similar vein to, to the English courts, that the Scottish courts would be, would be keen to, to make it clear that the war in Ukraine doesn't automatically mean that the grave risk exception is established and that we do take that detailed analysis that's required by the convention. Um, before I, I went on to grave risk, I just wanted to kind of briefly mention the habitual residence um, defence as well, um, because I do think that's something that, that might come up in a lot of these cases um, involving Ukraine. Um, if there's sort of return shortly after a child has been abducted, then the likelihood of, of habitual residence changing is, is maybe less, but we have had a couple of cases, one of them ML against JH, where um, the court decided that the habitual residence of the child changed almost immediately on the, the wheels of the plane lifting up off the ground to go to the new country. Um, so we can have that shift in habitual residence quite quickly, which would, which would obviously cause problems with the, the Hague Convention. Um, we've also had quite a number of children living in Scotland since the war began who've now been at school for over a year, established lots of friends, family maybe living here. And as the time increases, that possibility of, of habitual residence shifting um, does, does change. Or, uh, we've had cases as well, um, H against W, where it wasn't a Hague abduction case, but um, they were looking at whether it was in the best interest of children, return children to Dubai with their father. And the fact that they'd been in the UK, been in Scotland for four years was relevant. And that was part of what was taken into account by the courts. Even when there's temporary moves for trial periods or, or periods that are less than a year, um, the courts have said that the child's habitual residence could change um, quite quickly. And, and, and that was a case of F against M um, just in 2021. So we'll see what happens when that comes before a, a judge um, in, in relation to um, Ukrainian children. And I know it's, it's quite a factual question, so we'll see what happens. And especially given the, the circumstances and the reasons for the move, um, that might be relevant, but it is something that I do think is going to, is, is going to come up quite a lot in these cases. Um, so the other main ground that the Article 13b, grave risk. Um, so when we're, when our courts are assessing grave risk, given the, the current situation of the war, sort of persistent missile attacks and the like, the, the defence is most likely to be raised um, and there's potential for the courts to say that it's engaged, but our courts have been clear in recent case law that it's a detailed assessment of the, the, the particular risk for the particular child in the particular circumstances that's needed. Um, I think I said earlier that, that there's no blanket approach to sort of particular countries or situations. And we've had a recent case of AD against SD where the court refused return to the US given the lack of effective legal protections. The court weren't willing to make assumptions about the position of a particular country or how an individual situation would be approached. And they looked at the detail of, of what would actually happen for that child. Um, so we've got lots of cases where they, they may appeal sort of similar on the face of it, but once the court dig into the detail um, before they decide on the individual situation of grave risk, it, they can just, they can diverge quite a lot. Um, in the context of Ukraine, what that would mean is that the court are, are looking at the status of the war, what independence evidence there is available for that, the situation in a particular town or country, the regularity of attacks, how the court systems are working there, whether schools are running, shops are open, and really just assessing the situation on the ground for that child if they were returned. And that likely means that there'll be different outcomes for different regions. So similar to the English case of Q against R, where there was return made there because of the particular circumstances of that that town but when they were discussing return to Kiev then there was a different approach made there um, and I think that's the, the, the sort of position of Scots laws are not willing to take things at, at, at sort of face value and they will interrogate the situation to see um, whether there is a risk rather than um, making assumptions just because there is a war. Um, to close off that, I suppose that protective measures can also come in into play and our courts really keen to find out what protective measures are available if they're looking at grave risk. Um, obviously, that's a bit more difficult when, um, you know, it's the, the, the wars out with parents control, but there, there can be certain things that can be put in place to alleviate um, the grave risk. And I think that um, if certain undertakings are given and the like, then, then that's the kind of thing the court would, would, take, into, would take into account. Um, one last thing as well that I thought might be worth mentioning is um, in Scotland we've um, 
recently had um, cases where the courts have looked at um, children's immigration status when they're ordering return. Um, so where a child is considered a refugee and there's Hague proceedings raised, um, the Refugee Convention allows for an order to be made, but it can't be implemented whilst the child remains a refugee. Um, so we've had a recent Qatari case in Scotland, which um, is called A against B, um, and the child had refugee status in Scotland and orders were sought for return of her parent, return to her parents in Qatar. Um, so it wasn't a Hague case, but the court did follow um, an, English, an English Hague case of G against G, um, where they said that the same principle applied, that return could be ordered but not implemented while the child had refugee status. Um, in Scotland, Ukrainians their status isn't quite the same as refugee status, so there won't be a, a legal bar to returning under the, the Hague Convention, but the nature of their visa might be a consideration for the court. And certainly if um, some Ukrainians have perhaps applied for refugee status, then it's something that would be relevant. So again, just something um, that might come into play in, in the court's approach to, to return orders here. Um, I, I, I guess our, our overall approach in these cases is quite a detailed granular analysis rather than making assumptions and generalizations. So, um, you know, the Scottish courts are, are alive to the terrible situation the war has created for families and, and how that is constantly evolving. Um, and they're trying to be quite sensitive to dealing with these cases to see where we can assist and um, support families affected by the war. And, and those children that aren't returned, we'll still continue to provide them with support here where we can in Scotland. and. I guess it's sort of we're we're taking the same approach as as the other states where we're we're continuing to apply the convention and continuing to look at the individual circumstance of a child and not taking any blanket approaches. Um, so I think yeah, that's something that needs to be communicated to families so that they they know the position and aren't aren't working on assumptions themselves. Um, so I'll I'll hand back now. <laughs> Thank you, Shanish. That was great. We appreciate that. Um, Okay, our next speaker is Manuela from the Manuela Terrini Law Firm. She specializes in Italian, uh, European and international family law. She's been practicing in Bologna for 30 years. She's a Supreme Court lawyer qualified to practice before the higher courts. Um, so thank you so much, Manuela. Thanks to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to this event. I'm very it's a, a, a great pleasure for me to be here. Mm, a few words regarding this, um, what we are talking about today, because in Italy at the moment, um, we have no return orders in Ukraine. I mean, during the war. Because uh, um, let's say that uh, Italy uh, ratifies HEC Convention 1980, uh, 1980 in 1994. And in the years, the application of, of Article uh, 13B has been more and more reduced, just like uh, the um, HEC, the spirit of the HEC Convention 1980 says. And uh, now we can uh, um, surely say that uh, the um, Article 13b is not, uh, uh, yes, is applied but just like an exception and war in this case in, uh, um, at the juvenile courts, which are competent to decide for incoming child abduction cases. Uh, the war is considered as an exceptional um, event, uh, a grave risk for the child. So you know that in Italy, uh, the the orders, the return orders, but in general, the decision of the first and the second grade for, for the phase of the of the trials are not published. So no, only the uh, Supreme Court orders. And um, at the moment, I have talked to the head of the central authority in Rome, and he told me that he do not remember when I call him any case um, where has been ordered at the return of the child in Ukraine, just because the risk for the child was considered too big. 
and uh, that's why I, I have um, many uh, conversation with the judges of the juvenile courts because I don't know if you know if you are aware that in Italy uh, the juvenile courts are not so many. There are only, for example, only one in Lazio and Rome, only two in Lombardia, Milano and Brescia. There are not so many and the judges are not so many. So I have the, because I have been dealing with the uh, uh, Hague um, uh, international cases uh, for many years. So I have uh, talked a lot uh, about uh, those cases with many judges and I said that uh, of course, um, it must be an, an, each case is uh, uh, is a case that must be decided uh, um, considering all the situation because there are some places in Ukraine that are not too dangerous. But in any in general, just like the guide to good practice says. Um, the guide to good practice uh, published by the. Hague Conference on, on Private International Law, uh, or can be considered a grave risk for the child. So uh, probably, I, I don't, I really don't know. Now I have checked the, the database of the central authority in Rome and um, at the end updated to December, 2022 and uh, um, at December 2022, uh, there were uh, 11 outcoming cases with Ukraine, 13 cases, um, ingoing cases, and but um, we have no. I have no. Um, no. No. I think that there are no return order. Uh, to the Ukraine, to to Ukraine. I don't know if, in some cases, just like I hope, because I really believe that what Alison said before is really correct. So um, I hope that some cases have been closed because of mediation, thanks to mediation. But uh, I really don't know because the cases are not published and we know only when they are they, when they are closed and when they finishes. I have de dealt with many cases, but no, no cases with Ukraine at the moment. So in my opinion, as far as I know, uh, some cases are still pending because the order uh, is not going to be to be issued the, the, the return order and the other are trying to, to find an agreement between the parties through the mediation in my, because I know the uh, juvenile courts in Italy and the war in Ukraine and what's happening there, it's a very, uh, a grave risk for the children. So that's the opinion of the judge, of course. So uh, this is only this is what I can uh, I can give you for as my overview for all the relation uh, regarding the child abduction cases between Italy and and uh, and Ukraine, because I think that Italy um, in in uh, in all these years in twenty five years uh, since uh, the. Uh, Hague Convention 1980 was applied in Italy. Uh, I think that Italy has um, now is uh, are, is well is applying well the Hague Convention, but uh, there are still some things uh, that are uh, very difficult to to make understand to the judges particularly regarding this case, just like domestic abuse or something like that. There are some things that Italy, uh, even if uh, I, 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 I agree just with what Carolina said regarding that, uh, of course, uh, uh, we must consider that the Hague Convention is, uh, is a protection for the children. So it is true that the judges say that uh, we must consider it case by case, not uh, there is not an, an in Italy. You know that we have that we have not a um, 
only one, one law. There are different courts and different orders and different opinions, but in general, the return order in um, for, uh, regarding Ukraine is generally denied. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Manella, very much uh, for your insight into Italian jurisdiction. It was really valuable and interesting, and I'm sure that uh, more cases, let's say, to come. So let us expect some new case law in, 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 in Italy in this regard. Um, we have, sorry, sorry, just a few words. I, we have many Ukrainian people in Italy, many, but uh, they are uh, a part of our population, not uh, child abduction cases. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Karin Suzanne Delarue, our fellow colleague from Germany, who represents this uh, jurisdiction today. It appears that Germany kindly provided a shelter to the largest group of Ukrainian nationals as of now, and therefore we may expect the presence of some relevant case law in the local courts. Uh, thus, I'm passing the word to Green, please. Okay, not my first Zoom meeting. <laughs> Hello everyone and thank you for the nice invitation to, uh, from the Family Law Committee of the IBA and the Civil Family and Inheritance Committee of the UBA. This is very nice to talk to all of you because actually, Alexander, um, I was verifying the numbers before when I was preparing uh, my part here. And I actually do know Joanna very well. And I know her from the cross-border situation that we, of course, had. Germany received by now more than 1 million refugees that are registered, and Poland is just below. So it's just 100,000 uh, difference. This is um, a situation that uh, astonished me because uh, we I, I can only, uh, I only found three high court decisions to prepare for this meeting. And I think I can uh, show the arguments of the German jurisdiction very well on a decision uh, of the High Court of Stuttgart that was already published in Oct on October 13th in 2022. So what we have in Germany is we have a very short proceeding time for the Hague Convention. That means that family court is obliged to fix an audience in within a delay of six weeks and appeal court as well. So what we have in the, in the situation is we had married parents living together with their daughter born in 2021 in Odessa. During the bombing alerts, they spent the nights in the parking garage under their building. On March, on March 2nd, the mother decides without the father's consent to leave Ukraine with their child and spend the next time in Germany. It was not declared by the time to be a move in the meaning of not returning at all. On July 27th, the father filed an application based on wrongful removal of their child and asked to order the return of the child. He also ensured to have rented two apartments for mother and child and himself and could provide support of, uh, for both of them because that is very important. If you file for a return order in Germany, you have to provide it. The, the child was only born in 2021. So it was a small child and he could not um, estimate that the court would return only the child's return. So he had to provide support for the mother as well. What he did, so he did everything perfectly by this, by the Hague application, um, the Hague Convention, Convention in Germany. 
So the application was filed in July and court already fixed an audition on August 26th. It had immediately named a guardian ad litem. So this is a lawyer for the protection of children's role in proceedings in Germany and had auditioned the father and his Ukrainian lawyer via Webex because of course the father and the lawyer both male could not uh, exit uh, Ukrainian territory due, due to the war. On August 30th, family court rejected the return application and argued in an absolutely clear way that the mother had, as a matter of fact, wrongfully removed the child from Ukraine because there was no doubt in the habitual residence of the child in Ukraine and the father had never consented the relocation to Germany. But, of course, then court applied Article 13b which is rather raw in Germany and has not been applied during COVID. So Article 13b was not a reason to not return a child if in the country of Italy, for example, was the very, very severe COVID situation. But in this case, uh, the German family court declared that there would be a serious danger for the ch child's health, either in physical or psychological way. The father received the decision in September 6th and filed in the great delay appeal uh, within the delay on September 14th. He added an auxiliary request of returning the child to the Republic of Moldavia. So if not to Ukraine, then to Moldavia, because Moldavia would be secure in his eyes. The then competent High Court investigated the situation again and came to the same results. What is very impressive, that is the High Court's research, because it is a still very concerned statement declaring that the child has undoubtedly been wrongfully removed, but on the own research of the High Court, they decided that the return was nevertheless too dangerous for the child. They did not only consult the travel um, the travel alerts of the foreign ministry, but they also consulted different uh, and several other sources on the precise region. So in the in the decision you have, uh, the citation of bombing alerts on the region of Odessa. You have precise and detailed prescriptions of um, the war situation ongoing in the region. The father demanded to get the child returned on. So in Germany, the court has the right to investigate itself. And it's, or it's not only a question of evidence you bring to court, but usually they do that on their own. So they re refused to return to, to Ukraine, to the region of Odessa, because they declared that it had been a too imminent harm for the child. Then, as they refused, uh, refused the principal request, they had to decide upon the auxiliary request to return to the child to Mold Moldavia. But as neither Article 12 could be applicable because the mother, the caretaker, didn't live in the Republic of Moldavia, and there has never been a, res a, a habitual residence in Moldavia, they rejected that as well. So that was the first case. The second case uh, is from another high court from April 23. And we have two older children then brought to Germany as well on March 3rd, so approximately at the same time. But those children were already ongoing sub uh, subjects to ongoing custody proceedings in Ukraine. So it was very clear that there was no consent of bringing them to Germany. And in the same way as the other high court, the family court decided that there would no, not be a return. The arguing was very precise in the same time from the family court and the appeal court, declaring that children can live in war zones, so that this is not uh, a 
a white sheet. So you cannot only declare a, a country a war zone and then uh, refuse returning the, the children. But they estimated the precise region in Ukraine actually too dangerous in present times. And so they refused, they refused the return. There had been in high court uh, an auxiliary request of the father to order the return within one month after the ending of the, of the war. And that was very interesting and well, as well, because um, actually the father had missed the appeal delays. So usually if, uh, if a delay has been missed, the high court just rejects the appeal. But then they considered this case so important that they argued as well. So they told, they, 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 in the decision, you can find the reasoning that even if he had respected the delays, they would have rejected his request because of the danger, the imminent danger. And they did the same research as the other high court did. So even if they weren't competent anymore, they decided, uh, they, they showed in, in a very large way how deep the research of the family court has to go to apply Article 13b. And they decided that you cannot order a later return because the Hague Convention is to be applied very fast and it has to issue the orders immediately to re-establish the, the, the situation for the child. So you cannot re uh, order a later return, not only because it is very difficult to estimate one, when one will consider a war ended, but uh, that the, the, the goal of the Hague Convention is the immediate return. So this was the second decision. And then we had a third, third case that was quite different because there was a return con uh, request of a Polish father because the mother had removed their daughter from Poland due to the war in Ukraine. So she said that living in, the, in Poland was too dangerous because there would be an imminent risk of uh, the Russians attacking at Poland as well. So this, uh, request was followed, so the uh, the return was ordered because actually living in Poland does not bear a danger of imminent harm for the child, and so the application of Article 13b was refused. So what we can say in Germany is obviously that the return to Ukraine will probably will be refused by court, and that so for the. Uh, the parent living in the Ukraine, mediation is the only option to negotiate, for example, a return to Moldavia or in another region, region close uh, to, to the coming back. That's it, unfortunately, I think, for the remaining parent. Thank you very much. Yes, Karin, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting and it was... Uh, very important for us to know that there are already existing uh, case law and uh, this case law is is, is, is rather definite uh, uh, in uh, how the German courts uh, consider the ongoing war hostilities on the Ukrainian territory. Um, uh, we have a question uh, from uh, from our uh, from our uh, 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 Cassation Civil Court judge, uh, Mrs. Uh, Stupak, and she's asking the following. What were the motives of the German court uh, when, uh, when it uh, recognized uh, the relocation as illegal? Um because uh, in the beginning it was clear that both in both cases the father had not consented the the the, uh, the move to to germany so in the first situation the mother the mother live, um, quitted ukraine 
secretly so she didn't even tell the father she was just like leaving in the morning and she didn't come back so uh, the father filed rather immediately the return request and for the second it was clear that there was no consent because they were already having custody issues in Ukraine. So there was an ongoing custody proceeding, though the father would never have consented uh, leaving the children, uh, letting the children leave with the mother. Did that, is that responding to the question? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I, I guess, I guess, yes. I guess, yes. So uh, in my opinion, uh, the motives are clear. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, Mrs. Tupac uh, would have any additional questions, uh, so she would she would write uh, additionally. And I think that after the presentation of the last speaker, we can uh, like uh, continue with this if necessary. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, uh, one of our closest allies, foreign supporters, and definitely best neighbor. Poland. Uh, it was Poland who embraced hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians from the very beginning of the invasion, providing them with a shelter and home. Uh, today, Poland will be represented by Joanna Solik, advocate and fellow of International Academy of Family Lawyers. Please, Joanna, the word is yours. Hello, everyone. I will try to be short because I know we are far, far behind the schedule. I am very happy to, to speak on this panel because I believe that we have in Poland a very particular perspective on the issue. And this is because of the numbers. From the beginning of the war, there is more than 12 million of Ukrainians who crossed the border. Uh, some of them stayed in Poland shortly and then moved somewhere else. Uh, many of them stayed and a huge number of them return to Ukraine. So right now we have like uh, 1 million point five refugees in Poland. Um, counting also Ukrainians who are not refugees in the sense that they arrived to Poland before the war, but they decided to stay because they don't want to return uh, because of the war. So even though not coming to the Poland because of the war, now uh, many of them are staying because of the war. Uh, what does it mean in a practical terms? Uh, I think that Polish people being so close to Ukrainian uh, have a very good understanding on the situation on the ground and uh, of the geography of the Ukraine. So. Uh, I think that our sense of, of the danger is a little bit different because we don't learn it only from TV, but very often on the personal basis. Uh, I would say that Polish judges have been extremely active in hosting Ukrainian families. So many of them has a personal experience of living under the same roof with Ukrainian families coming from different regions. So for this reason, they have a very good sense of what is the situation in Ukraine. So that was the first remark. Uh, I think that we deal mostly uh, with cases of the wrongful detention, retention of the child, not of the abduction. And this is because uh, most of the people who came to Poland uh, have been coming with let's say, acceptance of the other parent. Uh, in some cases, this is not obvious because the law in Ukraine was that you needed to have the written permission to cross the border. And that changed because of the war. So there have been situations when the woman didn't have the permission to leave the country before the war, even though she wanted. When the war started, she didn't need to have this permission. And in this cases, you can argue that uh, having no contact with the father, uh, even though there was no permission uh, or there was case by case to be decided. Uh, if we speak about the wrongful retention, then the tricky problem we are facing is to determine the moment uh, from which you can speak about this retention uh, if we assume that the first movement 
to cross the border had some kind of acceptance, written or oral, uh, or even implied because of the situation in Ukraine. Uh, another remark is the understanding of the habitual residence. Uh, I think in Poland, uh, because of the fact that so many people return, uh, now the law is such that they have choice between two kinds of status. If they don't register, they are staying in Poland uh, based on this uh, temporary protection, the, which does not require any uh, legal work to legalize the stay. And this uh, stay is by definition temporary, uh, which means that I think you cannot speak of about the child getting to use to be in Poland because by definition, this is temporary. And the best proof of this is that uh, there is a huge number of Ukrainian children who have been still um, attending online school in Ukraine which means that the intention of the parent was to come back to Ukraine and to continue the education in the origin uh, country. Uh, and then in some moment it changes. So the mother makes the decision to stay in Poland and not to return. And that's when we have problems. Uh, another way to legalize the status in Poland right now is to apply for the uh, a temporary residence. And this is a step further because you are applying for a longer period. You are saying that you are in Poland not because of the war, but for different reasons, such as work, education, and so on. And in my opinion, if the mother decides to apply for this kind of legal residence, then the, the presumption is that her stay in Poland is not temporary, but the long term. Uh, and from this moment, you can uh, argue that the decision is to stay longer and not to stay only until the war is finished. Uh, I am a huge fan of mediation. And even though I said in the very beginning that the Polish judges are very sensible to the situation in Ukraine, and for this reason, I don't think that they would make the decision just based on the fact that Ukraine is war but the decision will be very much nuanced depending on the region and also on the situation of the father. Because from my experience, we have two kinds of left behind fathers. The one who are not active in military, which means that they are living in a safe part of Ukraine and they are continuing the normal life they used to have before the war and they can provide for the family and the child this normal environment in a safe part of Ukraine. But you have also fathers who have been mobilized and who are either in the active duty or let's say in the disposition of the army being very active, which means that they cannot provide for the child the safe environment because uh, they are in their very imminent risk of being killed themselves. Uh, and I would say that those kind of parents who are um, active military, they have, they have a very difficult task to convince the court that they can provide the safe environment for the child being themselves in war. So this is another aspect. Uh, and finishing with mediation, uh, I think that the huge bargain that the mother can do, uh, trying to convince the father to accept the temporary long-term stay outside of Ukraine is visitation. Uh, because my experience is that the 90% of fathers cannot leave Ukraine, which means that if the child is in Poland, doesn't matter, uh, with the agreement or the father or without, father is technically separated from the direct contact with the child because he cannot travel to visit it. So the only way to preserve this close relation between child and the father is if the mother agrees to go back to Ukraine for the short time of vacation, whatever, but to keep this relation alive. 
And well, in my opinion, this is the place for mediation uh, where we have the, the acceptance of the father to stay uh, and the acceptance of the mother to send child or go with the child to Ukraine to spend holidays, vacation, weekends, uh, whatsoever, but to allow this direct contact. We do not have in Poland an official registry of all the decision. Uh, so I cannot give you the numbers, how many return decisions have been given. Uh, but my guess is that the decisions will be taken very much case by case. Uh, so we don't have the attitude that you cannot return the child to Ukraine just because of the war. But we have the very reluctant uh, position of returning children anyway. So uh, my guess is that uh, in many cases, the, the request for return will be denied uh, just because of many other aspects, not only the war, war being the pretext to, 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 to motivate the decision. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, we actually had a uh, long ago uh, a question, uh, and uh, I would read it. And uh, Stephen uh, has already kindly agreed to address this question. Uh, so the question is: uh, What if a child from Ukraine is living with mother in a country which grants temporary refugee status under its domestic law? Could an argument not be made that if father claims return of the child, court should not grant permission to return by virtue of refugee law principles, notably the non refoulement principle? Certain refugees from UA are living under quasi automatic protection states of host states, uh, no matter which part of Ukraine they come from. Uh, so, Steven, uh, are you ready to address this question? Thanks, uh, Alexander. Thanks very much. Yeah, I want thank to you. Give the American position on this because it's the opposite of the English position in their case G and G. In America, the Hague will trump any immigration, asylum, temporary status, temporary emergency status claim. We put the Hague above. Uh, any immigration claims in this country? Uh, maybe someone else uh, wishes to briefly address this, uh, this, questions, uh, this, this question, this particular question. Well, in Poland, we differentiate between this temporary protection that is given to Ukrainians automatically and the um, asylum status. So I would say that a huge majority of them is not applying for the pro, pro, as, asylum because there is no reason and there is a huge legal differences. Uh, and just this temporary protection, uh, in my opinion, because of those differences, doesn't qualify as any kind of excuse for uh, uh, refusing the return status. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen and uh, Joanna. Uh, I remember that Alice uh, has uh, has some questions. Oh, wait, did Farah want to say something? Farah, did you want to respond? So, so I was just going to say that in Canada, it's treated a little bit differently. It gives rise, like there's a, like, there's a specific case on point called AMRI versus KER, and it gives rise to a, a rebuttable presumption that the return of the refugee child gives rise to risk of persecution. But so it, it just basically heightens the threshold in the exceptions, um, but it's not, the Hague is not treated as a trump card in, in Canada. It's more, um, it, it does, it gives rise to this rebuttable presumption that you, you have to go into. So. Shanich, I see you. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned um, that we had a had a case where this question did come up and the court said that they, they could order return, but the return wouldn't actually be implemented given the refugee status um, and that was based on a, on the English case of G against G which Stephen mentioned so um, I mean Laura and, and, and Carolina can perhaps confirm but I think that, that we've got kind of a similar approach that if you've got refugee status that would be a, a legal bar to return under Hague. 
So Alex, I'd rather defer to anybody else who has questions um, because we have run over so far. So if there's anyone who's attending that has questions or even any, any of the uh, panelists who have questions for the other panelists now that you've heard each other. Yeah, definitely. So we are waiting uh, and I think that we will be able to address one more question and, 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 and then we will say goodbye to all of our honorable speakers and our audience. So. Олександр, там є одне питання до мене по строку. Я можу відповісти? А, так, звичайно, будь ласка. Так, да, питання адресоване мені, але я думаю, що всі зможуть на нього відповісти. Як практика має справлятись з обмеженнями в один рік при поверненні в Україну дітей в післявоєнний час? Питання дуже цікаве. Перше, з чого я б хотіла почати свою відповідь, це з того, що національні суди, ну, принаймні, Верховний суд так орієнтує національні суди про те, що оцей рік потрібно рахувати з моменту незаконного переміщення і оцінювати початок процедури країні перебування дитини. Тобто так, як передбачає стаття 12 конвенції. Саме в країні перебування. Не має значення, чи в суді ініціювання процедури, чи в компетентному органі. Мається на увазі подання заяви відповідної. Я чому цікавилась мотивами рішення німецького суду, оскільки суд оцінив оце переміщення після початку війни як незаконне, так я зрозуміла в зв'язку з відсутністю згоди батька на виїзд дітей навіть після початку війни. І в цьому плані, якраз в питанні розрахунку і обрахунку строку, важливим буде оцінка суду конкретних обставин, коли вважати настав момент незаконного переміщення чи незаконного утримання в Україні. Бо ми розуміємо, що може бути ситуація, коли батько, наприклад, погоджувався, щоб мама виїхала, з дитиною після початку війни, але дай Бог, от війна скоро закінчиться і мама не бажає повертатись. Це одна ситуація і ситуація та, яку розглядав німецький суд, де з самого початку не було згоди батька на виїзд дітей. І суд це оцінив як незаконне переміщення. Тому в цьому контексті важливими будуть обставини кожної конкретної справи. Чи то було незаконне переміщення, чи почався період незаконного утримання дитини, хоча на момент переміщення згода була батька, наприклад, чи письмова, чи мовчазна, саме в зв'язку з подіями в Україні, в зв'язку з війною. От така моя відповідь, тому я думаю, що тут одразу тако е конкретно не можна сказати, все буде залежати від обставин конкретної справи. І дуже дякую колегі, я почула майже відповідь на всі свої питання і зрозуміла один важливий аспект, хочу його так би підсумовуючи озвучити, в питанні застосування підстав для відмови в поверненні, як то пункт Б, наявність істотного ризику для дитини. Я так більшість схильні до того, що потрібно оцінювати конкретний регіон і конкретну ситуацію, ну, будемо говорити, в тому місці, куди просять повернути дитину. Тобто нам є над чим українським суддям подумати в цьому питанні. Дуже, дуже дякую. Так, дякуємо теж, Ольга В'ячеславівна. So, uh, the question was as follows. Uh, uh, how do you think uh, the uh, legal doctrine and case law would deal with uh, those uh, so-called limitations 
uh, applied by Article 12, I mean one year term, uh, when dealing with the cases of returning uh, kids to Ukraine uh, after the war. So maybe maybe someone has something to say, like very briefly. Or should or should they uh, translate it once? Can you can you just read it one more time? Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, how the courts? With, will will treat uh, this uh, one year limitation uh, term. I mean, uh, most likely all the re uh, return requests uh, would be filed uh, when this one year term applied by uh, Article 12 would expire. So how uh, courts would treat this uh, when there might be a, a lot of such return cases after the war would end? If you want, Alex, I can, I can address it from England. Yeah. So after one year, it will be, I think here, it will be habitual residence and settlement. So whether those children has become habitual resident in the country of refuge, in the country where they moved to. So it will be an examination of facts. So they could have become habitual resident one week after, like our Scottish colleagues said, like once they take the plane, or maybe they took them a bit longer when they are teenagers, they are still, they have strong links with friends still in Ukraine. So it will be an examination of facts. Um, then it will be the one year, as even if they are settled because the year has passed, the court can still exercise discretion as to whether it is in the best interest to be sent back to Ukraine. So I think that is the way that I, I see it, uh, the way that it will be dealt with in, in our country. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carolina. Stephen, did you want to say something? We have returned lots of children to um, what Americans might consider very, very poverty stricken places. And our jurisprudence has said that uh, you can't consider any of that. So I don't see how post the war, anyone would succeed easily on a claim that we're returning children to a post-war uh, landscape. I, th I think that would be very unlikely. Yeah. What about the one year? So the one year, um, we have a Supreme Court case called Lozano about the one year. And we thought until this Mozano case that you could toll the one year because of certain situations. The Supreme Court says you can't toll it, but you have to take everything into consideration. And it is a discretionary one year, not an absolute one year. Thank you. And Karen knows how to use her virtual hand and so does Maria. You guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I I always look for the virtual hand going, where is that thing? Okay, I I'm gonna it. go Karen. I found next. it finally. You're, so I'm you're impressive, back Karen. I can't even unmute, so you're just way beyond me. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So um actually I have I have doubts that the one year delay will be extended very much. So I think um the the Hague Convention doesn't allow what we would call in German jurisdiction analogies or the necessity of prolonging a delay that has been fixed. So a delay is a delay and the Hague Convention and the return proceedings are a very specific way and a very specific proceeding. So I don't think that this would be the case, but we would examine, as Carolina already said, the facts and um, in the custody hearing, the, the I think the wrongful removal to uh, Germany would be considered a, a fact that could eventually change the decision of the court if the children have not been integrated into society and surroundings the way they it's 
at least it's it's the child's benefit that should be uh, the perspective and um, the argument that not returning a child to a war zone or a post-war zone, I think that wouldn't be followed, but the integration of the child would be very pertinent. So I'm muting me. Representative Snitsko. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. I would like uh, just a small remark. Uh, we also discussed this issue uh, uh, with the Hague Conference, uh, with the Preparing Bureau of the Hague Conference in particular, uh, with the colleagues, uh, with another central authority. Uh, but the main idea was uh, that the temporary protection uh, has uh, this temporary character and uh, all the families and people supposed to return after the end of this uh, temporary protection period. But of course, uh, when we're talking about the application of the hate conference, uh, this is the crucial issue. Uh, because uh, one year period of time has elapsed completely in all cases. Uh, and uh, so I agree with the colleagues who talk about the uh, decision of the court uh, on the case by case basis. Uh, it could not be the only possible solution, uh, the only you know possible variant for the cases. So this is the main idea, uh, and a uh, small remark that uh, when, of course, we are, when we are talking about refugees, of course, uh, this is the one issue, and uh, the protection, uh, temporary protection, which is granted in EU, is a little bit another case, and we consider that the uh, application of this the protection uh, of the refugees could be applicable for the children and families uh, which uh, uh, travel to the EU after the starting of the war and actually uh, which are under the protection. From our point of view, these are two different categories of uh, children and of the ways of protection. So, thank uh, you. This is my remark. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> let it be. <laughs> it's very nice to see. You. Uh, so I guess that's all for today. Uh, I'm I'm very grateful to all speakers. Alex, uh, Alex, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt, but I think Joanna wanted to say something briefly. Yes, of course. Just just so, a very short so. comment. Looking on numbers, my guess is uh, most of the people left just when the war started and until the summer of last year. So actually one year is over uh, for most of the families. And my guess is that the huge wave of the cases we will see is when the war will be finished. And the people will argue that we are dealing with the wrongful detention because there was the permission to stay as long as the war is on. The war finished, temporary protection finished, expectation of the fathers is that the children and the wives were going back home. And that's the moment where I expect the rise of the cases based on the Hague Convention. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think that uh, it, it, it is also one of the reasons uh, why should uh, we organize and meet once again in a while. So uh, I guess like <laughs> finally that's all for today uh thank you very much uh to everybody to speakers uh to participants who stay with us until the very end uh so uh i think that uh we uh, had a lot of interesting uh and very valuable presentations today 
Uh, therefore, I guess uh, we would have uh, to meet uh, in a while and uh, discuss uh, these issues uh, once again when we would have a bit of more uh, new case law in this regard. So, Alice, uh, I pass the word to you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. You know, the IBA continues to work with the Ukrainian Bar Association and members of the Ukrainian legal community to support them, the Ukrainian people, and the rule of law. Um, the Family Law Committee is going to be leading a session at the IBA's annual conference, which is in Paris this year, October 29th through November 3rd. And this session's on November 1st. It's called Children, the Innocent Victims of War and Other Disasters. We will be talking about not just the abductions, I shouldn't say just, <laughs> but not only abduction, but all the other things that happen to children when they are living through um, disasters such as war, um, because we all know that they are a future and they suffer. Um, so if you can make it, we'd love to have you. Um, I do I do wanna thank specifically, not only all of our panelists, but um, Judge Stupak and Representative Snitchko and Alex and Victoria, you, you work so hard on this under conditions that the rest of us didn't have to work under. And we thank you so much for that. Um, I used to live in Moldova 20 years ago and work there. And I have to say, I came to know your culture and your country. It's beautiful. And um, you are a credit to it and your profession. And uh, I thank you very much for all the work that you've done today for this conference. And I'm gonna just leave you with a quote from Nelson Mandela. History will judge us by the difference we make in the everyday lives of children. Alex, Victoria, thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, like finally, I wish to thank, uh, of course, to IBA, uh, to UBA, and to our two uh, brilliant translators who assisted us. That's through. right, that's right. They were fabulous, fabulous. Thank you so much. So thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.